Hello, my name is Steve Hoffman and welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today we're going to begin our deep exploration into the world of the Enneagram. And before we start the recording, we already started having a little bit of conversation. So I'll ask Brian to go ahead and uh, pose his question or share his, his history again, and I'll make my little comment then. So Brian, tell them what you were just telling me. Yeah, as I was asking about the connection between the Myers-Briggs and the uh, Enneagram, because the last time I took the Enneagram, it asked for the results of my Myers-Briggs. I, I didn't. Un yeah. Wait, where did Brian just go? Brian? There we go. Am I there now? Yes, you are. What happened? I have absolutely no idea. That's really weird. It's very weird. Okay, we'll just see what <laughs> goes on. At least it came back quickly. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Hmm. Don't know. Okay, anyway. Um, yes. So one of the things that I did notice in my um, little uh, initial research was that there are a great many different tests that are available now. And there are um, a lot of different um, ways that those tests are being kind of positioned, one of which is as a bit of a comparison between other uh, typing sorts of models. So some people are trying to say, where is the overlay between this and this? And Myers-Briggs is one of the ones they're really looking at quite deeply there. So um, yeah, so for those of you that are joining in, we're having a little bit of technical problems on occasion, but so far it seems to be behaving. So hi, Kathy, hi, Denise, hi, everybody. Um, Okay, so let me start by telling you where I wanted to begin my little look around. So the Enneagram of Personality and the Change Grid is what we're here to really talk about. We're going to be looking at a variety of different Enneagram um, kind of uh, graphics. It's all the same model, but the languages is changing and how they go about giving you little insights on it. There's all sorts of little graphics we might be taking a look at. Um, but ultimately our goal is to answer a few questions. And that is number one, does this overlay on the change grid visually? If it uh, does, great, If it, then how? And if it doesn't, then does it overlay on the change grid conceptually? So can we find each of these different types that the Enneagram explores um, and find where its home might be on the change grid? Um, and then uh, if, the, if the answer there is yes, it does overlay, great, but let's say it doesn't overlay. Then the question becomes, well, is it then more that the change grid overlays on each of, of the Enneagram's types, but the Enneagram doesn't overlay on the change grid, if that makes sense. So um, I, I think it's important to kind of go back to what we said many, many moons ago. And that was that the change grid uh, begins when the question becomes, okay, now what? So rather than being a replacement for personality typing systems or yet another one, we instead wanted to find a way for them to all merge together. And in that act of merging, we should be able to contribute something to that model and that model hopefully can contribute something to us. So in the very, very least uh, um, application, we have to recognize that regardless of what someone's personality is, they still have available to themselves an entire change grid. So the change grid will overlay on the personality type, even if the personality type map doesn't overlay on the change grid. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. And then the last thing is that, assume for a second it does overlay in one way, shape, or form. Does it map edge to edge all the way across the change grid as we know it? Or is it really confined to a more limited space, a subset of the overall change grid? And so it's actually giving us much deeper detail into a smaller area of the change grid than the whole wall to wall uh, kind of situation that you see when you're looking at a default diagram. So uh, that's what we're going to hope to do. Now, I don't know how many of you have already done your, uh, your Enneagrams. How many of you have had the experience of filling out an Enneagram, either face-to-face, -face, live, whatever? Kathy, you're on mute. Tell us about your yeah, experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had it, um, I had my Enneagram done probably maybe 20 years ago. Oh. Uh, yeah, easily 20, yeah, 20 years ago. I had a number of people uh, that I knew who were really heavily involved in the Enneagram at that time. And there was um, 
so I have a very close friend who does it, and I have been able over the years to learn more about it, but also had my own type done. And, and what is your type, if you don't mind? My, my type is the perfectionist, which I always have to laugh at because I feel so far from perfect, but that's the point of the perfectionist. <laughs> ah, okay, fine. And did you have a wing that was noteworthy? Uh, yes, I'm trying to remember. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Oh, what no, my worries, no worries, no uh, worries. But I, I don't know. How uh, but, but yeah, the way that you actually have two wings. Um, yeah. And um, uh, one wing is the nurturer. And uh, there was another wing and I just can't remember which which one it was. Well, um, we'll, we'll definitely figure it out when we find yeah, the perfection yeah, yeah. on the diagram. So well, there's two wings. There are two wings. So here, let me give you guys a little bit. Of okay. That. Mine was a five with the wing of four. I remember it, seeing, but I don't remember two. Ryan, wings. you're a five wing four. I'm a five wing four. <laughs> really? Most of us have been killed off by now. <laughs> um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see. So Kathy, I think that makes you a one. I'm a one. And I actually, I actually doubled I was almost a four. Uh, uh, there was, I came out evenly one or four, but uh, my wings are, I guess, the ones next to you, the peaceful on either here. side of your, on either yeah, side the of whatever. Supportive, supportive advisor. So, um, peaceful mediator. Yeah, yeah. So those made sense. And, and my social style, my social style, which is an interesting corollary here. Mm -hmm. which is what you have when you have your tight your types sure. you know the social style i'm an i'm an amiable driver so it makes sense that uh the supportive advisor and the peaceful mediator are my wings excellent excellent okay denise unmute thyself tell us all about your background with the enneagram oh hello everyone um well i've just been using the enneagram with all my clients uh, since about 2005 and uh, it's a great eye opener and beginning to work with people that want to transform their lives so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very good very good so we have a we have a resident <laughs> authority hopefully yes yay um so because there are a couple of things that i'm still unclear on but nevertheless what i, I wanted to bring up to, to you guys now that you're giving me these, these examples is that depending on which test you take it may tell you what your wing is as well. So even though both wings are available, wherever you are, the numbers on either side are your wings. But your when you're doing the automated test, they can actually identify which of the two wings you tend to favor. And so that's interesting. And I'm sure the other one is a developmental experience in order to create a little bit more balance. Now, if you were to go out uh, and start Googling about doing some Enneagram tests online, free ones in particular, you're going to find dozens. Um, and they might be just variations on one another, but some of them feel distinctly different. They have a different number of uh, questions that they ask, different mechanisms for getting your answers input. Um, so it's, it's really, there's a lot of variety out there. Well, one of the things that I found in my research on the criticisms of the Enneagram is that the tests to determine your type are not as reliable or valid as one might hope. So one statistic said 72%, but this is the interesting thing. They said, that being said, anyone who reads the nine different types will resonate with one and their, their, um, their, their reaction or the one they choose tends to be over 90% accurate when they are, you know, when the tests are actually a more accurate test is actually employed in there. So what's that all mean? It means like, well, the whole world of testing for the Enneagram is still very much in a developmental, uh, uh, in, you know, some kind of way to really um, perfect it, if you will. But that doesn't seem to be really necessary in order for someone to determine what their type is and find value in the type. In fact, they said that people who have a certain fluency in Enneagrams can pretty much identify what someone's type is in a matter of moments in conversation with them or observing them. So Denise, is that something you found to be true for yourself after 17 years working with a model? I try not to do that because I think the most important part of the Enneagram is where your 
coming from what what motivates you to do the things that you do sure and so that's an internal conversation that you're having to to choose to take particular action and so it's not the action that you see somebody taking or the words that they use it's why they do that Right, because the Enneagrams is really, they might call it uh, something in the family of personality typing, but it really is a deep dive into the motivations that are underlying a person's, um, you know, behavior, etc. Right? Is that? that are... That's correct. So yeah. when I see somebody uh, trying to perfect something, I don't really know for sure if they're an Enneagram one, because they need to do that for a reason that's much deeper than I understand. All right. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. See, yeah, if I can comment here, uh, the, the titles are different than, uh, I mean, I'm used to using, I'm sure Denise will know this, the Russ Hudson model, um, yeah. which, which is a different, has a different set of titles than the types you have here as well. Yeah, it might be those. Everybody has a different uh, slant on the words that they use, but um, ultimately the type itself is um, described the same. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because Kathy self-identified as a type one, which was going to be, did you say the perfectionist? Was that the, the language you, you had? Yeah, in? yeah. And, and, uh, and actually, I mean, I think I, I was known more through my career as a reformer versus, but I understand mm -hmm. how the perfectionist is there. I, I've always struggled with that term for me because I can be really sloppy about things. I mm -hmm. mean, truly. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's not about day-to-day -day things. It's about the world, I think, when they talk about perfectionism or in, in, in so anyway, so it's, it's interesting. I won't go on further. Well, but, a... well, I think this is an interesting thing for you guys to be sharing right now, because again, if you read um, and just go to, to the Wikipedia to get things started, I think you guys know this. Anytime someone asks for something, the very first thing I'm going to do is go to Wikipedia because I want to know what is the, the mass population being told. And then you can go digging into different uh, experts' work and see some deeper uh, understanding, some interesting angles, et cetera. But I think that if you want to know what is the general public being fed about something, you can go to Wikipedia and go like, well, this is about as general consumption as you're going to get. Well, one of the things that it says down a little bit, it talks about some of the uh, criticisms that are going on, research and criticism. And one of the things it says is that among um, Enneagram practitioners, there is still ongoing debate and development about what certain things may mean, how certain things can be used um, as they're applying it to different sorts of fields. They're getting into a little bit more of a what I want to, what's the word I want to use for this? A little code of ethics, I guess, about how things are being applied and what people are, you know, how much meaning they're drawing from it so quickly, just based on what, a, uh, you know, a surface uh, glimmer might look at. In that regard, I don't know that it's much different than a lot of other <laughs> tests that have been out there for a good long while. But nevertheless, um, it has its share of, uh, of criticism, but the one thing that came out of it that I really, really uh, support is that while this model may still be lacking in terms of formal clinical research, academic sorts of uh, uh, proofs being developed, all that sort of thing, that doesn't deny that it has strong heuristic value among the people who are actually using it. They do find it to be a very useful and meaningful, insightful tool. Whether or not it has scientific valid validity does not matter if people find that it has personal uh, um, validity for them. You know, if it resonates mm -hmm. with them, there, uh, I don't know, with confirmation bias, I guess, <laughs> at the very least is going on, but they will um, tend to, uh, you know, uh, agree with anything that tells them what they believe to be true of, of themselves. So I think that in, in and of itself is a very valuable thing for us as human development professionals to understand. Our goal is to provoke thinking. Our goal is to get people to kind of step out of themselves for a moment, detach themselves, look at what, what's going on, and then 
us see it perhaps from a little bit of a different angle that might ultimately help them get to a much better place. So I we, would agree. You do you? Yeah. Yes, I, I agree completely because to Denise's point, you know, in medical school, we we learned this concept called structure function uh, integration. Into it. So we always look at the structure of a system and how it's supposed to function. The challenge becomes when it comes to human behavior, so much of those systems are subcortical, which means they're underneath consciousness, right? And every day. So anything that helped people understand what's underneath their behavior, mm-hmm. people don't often look at that, right? So we know we're having a challenge with something or we're experiencing something, but not many people understand what's behind it. So from my perspective, anytime something helps you identify that, now you have something to work with. Because I took the Enneagram five times and it all comes out the same. Okay. And I took the Enneagram five times and I got some real variations on certain tests, but I did see a consistent pattern arise after doing it. So and I think this is what, what I, I really want to be saying you know, we call this the circle of brilliance. And this exercise we're doing right now is called the merging of brilliance. We just want to find something we go, you know, I don't really care a lot about whether it's making everybody happy or stirring up a little bit of trouble. I just want to know if it's got some brilliance to it. Does it feel like it's something that's got some real substance? Does it resonate with enough people enough of the time that people go, that is useful to me? And um, if that's if that's it, then I go like, hey, we may very well be looking at something that by the time we're done, we're going to say that's just plain brilliant. Um, to be brilliant doesn't mean it has to be perfect in every way, shape, or form. And to be brilliant doesn't mean that it has to pass somebody else's standards or requirements for that. You, you know what I mean? It's just kind of like brilliance is found in every walk of life. So. Who's to say it can only originate through certain channels that have been, you know, deeply vetted and whatever. I, I just, I can't buy into that. Now yeah. that might be because of my type, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll find that out later. So uh, yeah, thoughts about that, Kathy, you want to share about your book here? Yeah, no, I, I just, the book that, that I've always found really helpful with this, that actually, when you get into you, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, I think it is, it, it does generally work. And, and, and a, the friend who, who knows me laughed at me when I said, I'm not a perfectionist. And she said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> but because I, because I was just either unaware or it's so deeply ingrained in me that I, that I can't, I couldn't articulate it or wasn't even aware of it at the time um but the but and and operate that way on a sub level um but um this book uh, is the wisdom of the enneagram and i'm sure denise is aware of this by rizzo and hudson the complete guide to psychological and spiritual growth for the nine personality types is really in depth and takes a look at the more sophisticated permutations of looking at your wings and your you know, your triangles and your this is and your that's and how you grow and the stages of personality growth that each type goes through with each subtype. And I found it remarkably accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you haven't done this kind of analysis with yourself, other than just taking it and looking at the basic subtypes, for those of you who really do enjoy diving deep, you know, this is a really it's been around for a long time this is an old book but 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 it really is a great book to to just dive into and 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 go go for it um if you want to analyze yourself or this yeah there's a lot of people have written a lot of things over a whole lot of years (laughs) once you start it's a rabbit hole that you could easily get pulled down and it's a fascinating one get pulled down denise i see your hands up something you want to throw in I just wanted to also throw out there that we all, uh, when we take the Enneagram uh, uh, assessment, you'll find out the type that you most resonate with. Most of us have all all of the types in us. I've only seen one report that had one person that didn't have one type in there that is at least one small uh, measurement of them having that type. 
so what I'm trying to say is really that all of us have the um, image of having just one type, but the real truth is most of us have a little bit of all of the types in mm -hmm. us. When you learn your Enneagram type, it's just the beginning of becoming aware of some of the habitual ways in which you operate. Mm -hmm. And that helps you become aware of your own self a little bit more so you can um, start asking yourself, do I want to respond that way that I always respond or do I want to uh, do something different? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think this kind of thing is always helpful because again, when I read like some of these criticisms of all scientific study, I was always trained that science is never complete, right? And so if we understand how the human system works, particularly the brain, first order business to preserve and conserve energy. So any kind of behaviors that we have, as Denise is talking about, their preferences, it does, it's not final, I've always tested to be an achiever, but I can guarantee you now that I'm in my 50s, the way I go about achieving is uniquely different than when I was in my 20s. Yep, yep. yep. Absolutely. Yep, yep. Agreed, so, agreed well, with all of this. As you guys are sharing this, to me, what you're actually saying is that what we've said about almost every other psychometric tool out there, while I can see how I test it out to be a whatever, I really think I'm all of these things. It just depends. So, so Denise, when you say that people have got contributors from all of these nine types, for the most part, um, does that, how do they end up moving from one to another? Or do they just, are they still themselves? Hmm, I know that's, I, yeah. Yeah, so you'll always uh, probably, I'd, I've never heard of anybody who changes types. Yep. But that again, that's the type that you most resonate with mm -hmm. in the habitual way of doing things because of a childhood story that you adopted yes. when you were a child. Yep. So um, so it'll be my tendency to go to a three all the time, but there'll be times whenever I'll bring out my perfectionist in me. And there'll be times when I will say, you know, I need to find a way to be the mediator in this. And so we'll mm -hmm. be able to use the strengths from certain types and also recognize our challenges from the types too. Sure, sure. Okay. And also, and see, if, you look at, if you look at that diagram, the, the lines on there, I mean, Denise knows this really well, mm -hmm. the lines that are connected under certain circumstances, the one goes to four. Mm -hmm. um, and then the four will go to two and the two will go to the eight and the eight. So there is, you know, we, you will jump around, you will exhibit different traits, but it, but it's, it's in a sequence. It's in a predictable sequence, according to the studies that have been done. Um, and, and allows us to have all of these within us. Um, but there are specific circumstances, and I just haven't been diving deep into this for about four or five years to remember exactly what circumstances will trigger it. But, you know, fear or life change or whatever um, will push us, you know, will move us into a different, uh, into a different, into exhibiting a different type or experiencing a different type. And so do you guys hear it like my ears hear it? I just heard that we're saying it depends on the situation. You happen to be and a lot of this is going to be circumstantially um, impacted and that I can go from one to another I'm going from uh, in a particular sequence or whatever I'm hearing change grid maneuvers I'm hearing tension mm -hmm. management happening mm -hmm. and so that's what I'm saying like energetically this feels like it has resonance uh, with what we are doing on the change grid. So I yeah, think and what I like about it, T, excuse me for interrupting. Let me just comment what, just one thing before you continue. It's a dynamic model, and that's mm. what I think it shares with the change grid. It, do, it is a dynamic model, the way it's presented. It does seem to share several, uh, I think, great things with the change grid. I, I just lost my screen. Are you guys still there? Yes. All right. <laughs> Just one second. La la la. I think I've diagnosed what the problem is though. So let me just share my screen real fast. 
It doesn't even see that screen now. Huh. All right, don't mind me. Chat amongst yourselves. <laughs> So, uh, one more thing I want to throw out is the language in the lines is that we have a stress line and we have a release line. So if you are a three, your stress line um, goes towards a six and your release line goes towards a nine, meaning that we have the opportunity to look over into that different Enneagram type and see what we can uh, gain or learn from that type in order to deal with our stress mm -hmm. or whenever we want to um, actually grow and um, learn more about ourselves, we go over to the other line and pick up their characteristics and traits. Mm -hmm. And so what I like about what Denise has just said is that I think it gives further evidence to the, that there should be some sort of an overlay because yeah. if the truth is that these are not arranged in just a haphazard kind of way, but there is very solid reasoning behind the, the positioning of these, and I know there is, mm -hmm. then this is what I've just heard. So Denise, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, good or bad, but from where I am, whatever I test is my most prevalent or whatever, um, I have some contributing um, impact of either of the two alongside me, my two neighbors, maybe both, maybe more one over the other, but I, my type is being modified by the types on either side of me. Is that correct, Denise? Um, you can. Yeah, so okay. What I like to say is you can lean over to mm -hmm. your buddy next door and see how their perspective on situations might be. So you can take advantage of being so similar to your neighbor that you can say, how would you see this? And so sure. you can look at things differently through the eyes of your neighbor's eyes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what that tells me is that no matter which one of these nine I am, I have a wing on either side of me and they're arranged in a particular order, which means, and this is the important thing, that you are looking at a continuum in, in motivators, I guess is what this is really all about. Mm -hmm. that it really forms a complete circle. So if you're a five, maybe you can do a little bit of a six, but if you're a six, maybe you do a little bit of a seven, seven, a little bit of an eight, or maybe we go this way. Seven does a little bit of a six, six does a five. We are looking at a circular continuum here. Do you guys know what I'm saying there? A circular continuum. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying, but it, I don't quite see the Enneagram that way though. Um, I, I uh, Only because I think that the construct in the middle, uh, the dynamic movement that Denise was talking about, the stressor mm -hmm. and release, and I couldn't remember the terms before, you know, a five goes to eight under certain yeah, circumstances. Integrated and disintegrated. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that it's that that particular construct is much more immediate. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it, I, I, I think it is a circular, you know, yeah. model well, that way. And that's important, particularly to me, because I want to know, does it overlay? Well, unless it is solid in its own arrangement, it has no hope of overlaying on the change grid. So the thought that, well, lo and behold, I can, maybe I can overlay this circumplex kind of diagram, the circular continuum on the change grid in a way that makes sense. And if it does, then those um, uh, integrated and disintegrated um, options, opposites, uh, wherever we happen to be, um, I think become super, super um, interesting as far as how people move on the change grid in a way that is natural for them as they are approaching or dealing with a situation. Mm. Does that does that make sense to mm -hmm. anybody? Is it? Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Like so, for example, let's just take a, a look at each one of these, and all I want you guys to say is. I can feel it, it's in an area on the change grid. You don't even need to tell me which area, just, I want you to just tell me, 
that that's that resonates energetically with a certain area around the change grid. So let's just look at only the words that are being used for this. So in five, it would be the investigator, the thinker. I don't know who, obviously, whoever pursue what matters is modified the language, but I think this is called the investigator type. Well, where, where do you think an investigator energy? Just decide you know what that means. Uh, and you know it enough to know energetically, where does that seem like it lives on the change grid? Yeah. That's the it's an downgrid. analytical. Yeah, yeah, analytical, it's downgrid, yeah. A little downgrid, just a little downgrid. Yeah. Um, uh, you wanna get any more fine tuned? Is it kind of a, uh, you know, again, this is the investigator. So does that feel like it has a secondary energy of analytical, expressive, driver, amiable? What would you say the secondary energy? Analytical driver, I think. An analytical driver, which would be up here, or the driven analytical, depending on whether you think that the investigator is primarily driven to accomplish something or primarily motivated purely by the acquisition of greater knowledge and understanding. From what I've read on mine as a number five and a wing four, it talked about the latter, what you just described, this pursuit of information just for information's sake. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that describes me quite, <laughs> quite yeah. to the T, literally. <laughs> right, like I used to tell everybody, if you're playing Trivial Pursuit, you want me on your team. <laughs> <laughs> Certain categories, I'm your ace in the hole. Others, I'm sorry, I can't help. But look what they're reading here for the investigator. Fives are excellent thinkers and strategists, okay? They seek to develop technical expertise and accumulate knowledge. They need lots of privacy and autonomy. Mm -hmm. now, there are some other things around there, but they're basically going, the, the investigator investigates things. And so I hear certainly an analytical energy and I hear a little bit of a driver energy. And so we could even just say, it's somewhere around here. Is that fair enough right now? We're just playing yeah. fish kind yeah. of off. Yeah, not I mean, too not too far, yeah, not too far yeah. driver though, not too necessarily too far driver, but-, but Not too uh, far driver though. Okay, I'm with yeah. you, I'm with you. So I'm squiggling like right there, right there, right there. Remember there is a layer of the change grid that divides it into nine types. So we're ultimately we're to see, does it overlay on that? Um, okay, so another one. Let's see, we'll bring this one up. Um, oh, well, well, go to, to Kathy, the perfectionist. <laughs> Hardworking, thorough, and responsible, prioritize doing things the right way, which can come at the expense of productivity. This is just some graphic sheet I found when I was searching around and it was talking about, I guess, for HR pros. I don't know if this is describing HR pros or if this is how an HR pro should work with the perfectionist, help them grow. Yeah, probably more of the latter. You asked my mother, this is not my type. <laughs> there you go, there you go, there you go. And your mother would know because she's probably a type one. <laughs> oh, she's a type one. She was a type one. There's no doubt. She was a supreme type one. So that's so go. all the all the psychological dynamics are in play here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh yeah, there we are, there we are, there we are. Um yeah, that's a type one. So this one says a type one. Responsible, thorough, hardworking, with high standards for themselves and others. They know how to do things the right way. They know how to do things the right way. Okay, well, what energy does that feel like it resonates with? Responsible, thorough, hardworking, high standards for themselves. See, that sounds more like the analytical driver as well. And I'm thinking it sounds a lot like a, more like a driven driver. Driven Respons driver? Yeah, responsible, thorough, hardworking, maybe certainly not danger zone, but right. I'm talking about a driven driver on their finest day. Um, hardworking, high standards for themselves and others. They know how to do things the right way. So they got a little bit of that analytical energy. So I'm still thinking it feels somewhere around here. So maybe between the analytical driver, the driver analytical little plot, mm -hmm. we put mm -hmm. that one here. Yeah. Okay, well, here's the problem with that. They're not next to each other. They're across mm. from one another. 
But the difference is the one is in the action center and the five is in the head center. So the five sits around and thinks about it more often than the one takes what they know is the right thing to do and go, goes to do it. All yeah. right. Yep. Yeah. I, I completely relate to that. And by the way, I think I have a diagram that shows it, but these three types over here, I think the nine, no. Um, okay. Five, six, and seven are head. Two, three, and four are heart. Yes. And one, eight, and nine are soul, yes. spirit, or gut. Body, gut. gut, or body. Yeah, gut or body. Well, when we overlay head, heart, soul, and gut on the four quadrants, gut is outgrid. Yes. Mm. So we got that one for sure. But, um, you know, again, my head's just going like, wait, where does this fit into this the whole thing? That would mean I'd be very far in grid and a little bit down grid if I'm over here. Mm, that doesn't feel right to me. So we're going to resolve this because in my head, I've already sorted it all out, but I just wanted to yeah. organize it to the torment that is T. Uh, <laughs> T, uh, I also, I'm sorry, I want to interrupt one more thing, and that is that each one of these types have a different level of integration. Yeah. So at a high level of integration, we are in the center of the change grid, and right. our, everybody has a type that has an opportunity to take their type to the center of the change grid. So at high level of integration, that's where everybody would land. Yeah, right. that's what that Russ Hudson book talks about. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's so, how to get to the center, how to get to the center. Yeah, so, I mean, not using that term, but yeah, how to get to the so center. So if I said, well, you know, in the perfect situation, the entire world of Enneagrams fits inside of the green circle. This is if every personality type is working to its, uh, uh, you know, to a, a noble expression. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the middle, we've got the ability to selectively choose and it doesn't need this gigantic energetic swing in any direction to get these things um, activated, integrated, deployed, uh, put into practical use, whatever good stuff's happening on the in-grid side of things. And so because you said that if, when you're at the center, you're all of these things, then I wonder, depending on where we call home, Mm. where does this circle actually reside? Does it reside downgrid or does it just have some downgrid energy available to it? Does part of the Enneagram uh, setup resonate very far out or uh, uh, in grid or does it just have a little bit of that energy that might be awakened? So are you guys feeling? Yeah, feeling? yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you, if you look at, you know, the stressors of what, makes somebody one of the types stressed yes. and how they act they will frequently be in the day you know you will find danger zone uh, traits if you read about this or study this that's where you will find it it's 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 the types under stress where you will find the interesting information about where they wow. end up on the change grid. and so when i'm moving around on the change grid is this whole diagram moving around with me Am I the center of the Enneagram, even though I may not be centered on the change grid? That would make it like the ultimate relative um, description set. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, this is the spiritual component of the Enneagram is that when we become so integrated and so Zen-like, you know, that we would be in the very center. Yep. And that's what I'm thinking. Yep. But, all right, and I'll just, well, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, we got 20 minutes. I'm going to throw this out there and then let you guys play with it however you want. The thing that gave me the greatest... Um, um, what do we say, um, push to center the uh, Enneagram diagram over a particular area of the change grid was one word. And that word was the word that was used to describe what the Enneagram is actually exploring. What is it, what it is actually revealing about a person. And there was one word, and remember what that word, one, one word was? 
Motivation. Motivation. So the moment the subject of the motivation comes up, the moment someone says, well, in truth, there are nine different sets of motivators, but there are, well, and actually they have more than that by the time around all their combinations and permutations, but nevertheless, nine basic ones. Um, then they're still saying all these types are motivated. They're motivated in different ways, but they're still motivated. So just focus in on that one word and tell me where does motivated live on the change grid? Outgrid. Oh. More outgrid. Maybe a little upgrid if whatever the situation is, is something external that's kind of pushing itself onto my reality. I, I can still be motivated to, you know, make the bear go away, you know, but I didn't invite it in my reality. If I'm the boss of my bus, I'm thinking I'm, I'm out there looking at some aspect of life or whatever that, that is, I need to be motivated to do. Well, if I'm too far down grid, am I motivated down here? What do you think? Do I need to pull up the? No, no. I mean, no. 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 I mean, I might be motivated to stay on the couch and watch Netflix, but you know, I'm, I'm not motivated the way the Enneagrams are talking about uh, motivating. I mean, look at these words that they're using as descriptions. None of these are lazy people. The reformer, the helper, the achiever, the individualist, the investigator, the loyalist, the enthusiast, the challenger, the peacemaker. Do any of them feel like they're taking a nap? Not at no. all. No. And neither do they feel like they're so far upgrade, they're in some panic sort of state, just reacting from their survival instincts. So, so how do we account for then what uh, Denise was describing in terms of the stress and the release line? Because so well, if you're upgrade, then you're externally motivated by something. And would it be that that's when you rely on that heuristic in terms of the actual type itself mm -hmm. in order to respond. Is that how that works? Oh, there's a lot of creative ways people are actually integrating this into coaching discussions and uh, you know, spiritual <laughs> development sorts of things, all that. So what you've just said is absolutely accurate. Just consider it to be a subset of the full range of stuff that's Got going it. on there. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking about my own self because that's how I tend to, when whenever I'm stressed, and it was that way all through medical school, you you wouldn't know it like I don't show it like no one can ever say they heard me yell or get you know expressive in that way I go inward that's where my journaling and those kinds of things come because I'm learning for myself like why did something trigger me right that's just a default mechanism that I train myself in and that I know to do yeah you know because I've been reading a bit about the whole uh idea about uh where the four scratch that just a second, five with the wing four. Um, one of the things that it says is that if we are under stress, what we should be doing uh, is really moving into this protector mode. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And if we are trying to escape whatever it is that's going on, avoid, we become an epicure, which is basically seeking out things that we find interesting, pleasant, curious diversions, yeah, interesting ideas, pleasurable experiences. This is how we would escape. Exactly. This is how we would be more activated. Exactly. So I don't know, we'll certainly that's that's it. Yeah. That's exactly. So we just stay it. as an observer where nothing's changing. So we need to be an observer that's ready to rise to the occasion. Um, otherwise, we might just feel so withdrawn, so whatever that we fall into Epicurean sorts of things. And again. I'm walking evidence of that. You guys know I've been trying to lose 20 pounds for the past, how long have I been in business? <laughs> <laughs> so, come on. <laughs> yeah, all right. So uh, I think that's all very interesting, but let me just kind of uh, get back to putting my, my little uh, point out here. I believe that if this is really focusing on motivation, that I can lay this completely over the outgrid quadrant. And when I overlay on the outgrid quadrant, something very interesting happens. That five quality is now right down here, which is where we thought it was going to be energetically anyway. But I said, yeah, but now shouldn't the one be on the polar opposite? No, the one is up here, which would now be someone who's on the border between a driven expressive driver and an expressive driven driver. 
And mm -hmm. that's that perfectionist uh, kind of description resonating there. So I can easily see, this is the just getting to the end of the, to the chase. If we go all the way around, yep, we can find a really good overlay that's happening. Aware, so, I mean, I would think that the successful achiever, whatever that is, whichever one that is, um, yeah. Yeah, would have to be straight out on and towards uh, on the on the um, yeah. power, you know, directly. Yeah, um, yeah, and see, that's where I'm getting kind of baffled by this because I right. would say, how can the helper be out here? The right. motivator down here. Do I need to flip this somehow? I, that's that's to you. When I first looked at it, I said this needs to be flipped. Yeah, mm. because I think the reformer energy, the reformer energy may very well be. It's much maybe, yeah. The uh, well, we, we use the word reformer for it down downgrade anyway. That's one of the. That's things. that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the at the type as at the what I call the social style types. Right. Uh, the you know the um, uh, analytical driver, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mean, that's what comes to my mind. You flip the you flip the enneagram and put it there, and you're going to be much more. I I don't know. That's my guess. Yeah, well, that's what's the fun part of this whole thing, because it, you know, because it's presenting itself in a way that says there is a distinct systematic arrangement of these, and there is a progression of some characteristic that is um, changing depending on where you are on the circumplex. That right there screams to me that this overlays, that it has a lot of structure. Now the puzzle becomes how. And I can certainly see that if the reformer is slightly downgrid, more of an analytical kind of driver, um, that that peacemaker may very well have to be the most driven driver of them all. They're the mediator. They don't have to be. Remember, often when we think of a driven driver, we really are thinking about the driven driver in the danger zone because so much of the driven driver energy can be inherently problematic. But I'm talking about a driven driver on their finest day the driven driver who's really doing their best to make everything work, work well, et cetera. I mean, I, the word peacemaker is pretty interesting of a descriptor, but I think this is the guy who's running the show. This is the gal who's, well, you know, queen of whatever it is that is being undertaken. This is the person who's really in charge. Um, uh, and then I think they're also modifying the leader because the leader feels like a little bit more, uh, you know, but I mean, can you guys feel the, that there's something there, but we need to just figure out how to rotate it? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. something there, but but I, it's not totally clear yet. No, 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 it's not. I also want to say that the word motivating um, is not really an action word in the Enneagram. It's like where are they coming from to make sure that they will be safe and secure and loved. Mm -hmm. So the motivation is something internal of their, you know, yep. desire and belief, but it's not really so much in action. It's not so much about motivation to do something. It's how do I survive in this? Yeah, planet? yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, even that though still resonates with what my thoughts are about being outgrid, because I think that when we're talking about, as you first framed it, the, you know, making sure people are feeling loved and included and all the things they really want, that to me is about creating this, this in-grid, rather this mid-grid uh, PowerPoint kind of an experience. But I wonder if I've got someone, so Denise, I'll tell you, you've got a client who is a driven, driven driver. And they are um, rather ag aggressive with people. They're, um, they're agitating and agitated. They are always in a fighting kind of a mode. That's that person. Well, I have to believe that person is an extreme version of one of these. But it can be an extreme version of every one of those. So the lowest level of integration of a person, they operate from that 
extreme level of aggression or or dysfunction or fear you know, yeah okay each All right. one can um actually be really messed up and not in a healthy happy life depending upon you know their own circumstances but each type could be out there right well, and that's my, uh, that would be, be an interesting thing to look at then because then we're saying like, no, we have to just apply this to the individual. It's not going to overlay. Um, I still believe there's enough here that we could overlay it. And by the way, you know, I always say this and I don't mean anything arrogant when I say it. I believe that when we can successfully integrate something, we are able to enhance that model as much as that model is enhancing what we're doing. So no one's ever going to accuse the Enneagram of being perfect. It's been in its own evolutionary process for generations. I don't, I know it's got some ancient roots, but back in the 1950s and maybe a little earlier is when it got its most recent heyday. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I, I go, well, the, these extreme people exist. They have an Enneagram. Is it one of these that's at an extreme because they, if you've got that person, bottom line, they have a personality. So, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think, I think, I mean, I think it does make sense that the perfectionism at its worst, at its, its extreme, because I know, you know, when I am at my absolute worst, I am highly critical of myself and others and I don't act out. I'm not the kind of personality that acts out aggressively, but I, I know that that energy is there. And so I can see how that would, but I also see myself in other danger zones when things go wrong, but I could see how that perfectionist part of me could end up on that, on that side, on that that, on that danger right, right, right. zone, outgrade yeah, danger well, zone. And, and think about what you've just shared, shared there, Kathy. That this whole perfectionist energy probably um, spends a lot of time feeling what we feel when we're right here on the change record. It's 12 and zero right there. Some of the words were frustration and resentment, a feeling of being held back by people, yeah. situations, you know, because look, you're saying your ability is extremely high and the challenge, you know, has been conquered, even though it's the, the, the challenge represents a clear and present um, issue, but nevertheless, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. So that's why the reformer energy is basically saying, "People, get with it." Yeah, get with yeah, it. exactly, exactly, exactly. And yeah. and my spiritual growth moves more, which moves me more toward the the two, the giver. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's where I'm ending up in my life is moving from the the one to the two to a much greater extent mm -hmm. towards the amiable more in more in grid toward the center which is the amiable driver type mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. see this but, makes sense to me because we're talking about energy so when i think about the word motivation the key word inside that is motive right yeah so there's no part of human behavior that is static it's always moving and a lot of times when we look at things medically speaking the mind is often playing catch up to where the body has already been. Mm -hmm. So yes. a lot of times this expression of it or the outward appearance is what we're seeing. But again, there was something dealt with internally or some kind of movement internally. Mm -hmm. And so if we understand the from position, as I call it, that's where these kinds of things become important. And it's, it's yeah. important to identify it. So maybe that primary type is the from position, because I know for me, it's always been about letting go, just let go, let go, let go, let go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's let go of frustration, anger, you know, why don't they, why don't, why don't they get it? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I know that there was a whole part time in my life when it was like, why don't they get it? And it's like, that, what, a, what an awful way to live. I mean, I had to let all mm -hmm. that go. Yeah. Yep, yep, so I yep. think that's the pat perfectionist energy as we're talking about. And I don't mean to have this be about me, but I mean, it's interesting as we're talking about it, 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 it makes sense. Very interesting. So, yeah. so when, I, when I look at it, um, you know, we talked about the influence of situations, but I think also what influences movement is role definition. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about that layer of the change grid that looks at roles. 
Um, and I think the value of the Enneagram is the ability to recognize when there is a need to move beyond what's dominant in us. Mm -hmm. Because someone made the comment earlier that, you know, the likelihood is that we have the potential of each of these, uh, but there obviously is a dominant one or two or whatever that number may be, but different situations and different roles we play in those situations may um, require of us to be able to pull upon some of these other strengths. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if point. we experience the, that demand as being uh, out of type, that's going to take a lot more energy to be able to perform and pull off successfully mm -hmm. as opposed to if it's an in type kind of a thing. Yeah. I'm still struggling with, with where the performer would end up. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am, but that's the fun of doing the merging of brilliance. You go, look, this is brilliant. So even if it only integrates um, conceptually, that's fine. It doesn't have to integrate visually. It just feels like it's got a lot of promise <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, T, would the performer it. end up somewhere where um, charm would be? See, um, when I think about, okay, let's look around this. Who around here is the most charming? Um, the three. The three is charming. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. 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 Because okay. they're okay. motivated to have everybody look at them and right. say, oh, aren't you awesome? Yeah. yeah. So that's expressive. That's up in the expressive a little side. Bit more upgrade. Yep. So as we're moving down this, we seem to be going up energetically. Mm -hmm. And that might make sense because if we were to really say let's take an epicurean and um look at them on their worst possible day anyone remember enough about who epicure was to know what epicure would look like on his worst possible day what's that the stoic you talking about no epicure no epicure is oh. the opposite of the stoic the epicure is the the guy who's sitting there eating all the pies that's right <laughs> gluttony no gluttony is the big deal gluttony is, is the big deal wow and so uh, that would definitely feel like more of a downgrade kind of a, a place to be. And again, generalist, again, we're interpreting what these words mean. Just yeah, I mean, those different. words don't always, I mean, the interpretation yeah. words. Don't, don't like uh, seven is also called the enthusiast. So right. Sevens are quick thinking, adaptable and positive in their outlook where other people see problems, they see opportunities. Well, that's definitely more of an upgrade than a downgrade vibe, isn't it? But it says it's motivated by fear. Is that what this is all about uh, here, Denise? Yeah. The three of them are have a fundamental fear. These are likely to get angry and these are really image conscious. Is that what this is saying or? Right. Yeah, hmm. they wanna know how they look, how to they're others. perceived by others, right? Yeah. These just get really upset with anybody and everybody. So, and, and these in here uh, have a fear of some sort. Uh, like I would imagine, I know that personally, the greatest fear disclosed for a five is to be found to be incompetent or not able to be self-sufficient, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So mm -hmm. that's definitely a fear, but I don't know what an Epicurean is afraid of. You know, not to... having enough experiences in life, so they keep on going. And oh, these are our FOMO people, fear yes. of missing out. Yes. Okay. And this one, probably the loyalist fear is a loss of stability, predictable uh, safety and security. Safety and security. Yeah. yeah that's me. Yeah, there you go. All right. So, six. anyway. Our, our time is up for this. I just wanted to, to bring this the subject up. But here's what I would encourage you guys to do. If you just do a Google search for free Enneagram tests, you're going to find a bunch of them. So try a few of them. They, none of them take a particularly long amount of time, maybe five minutes or so. So you can always go digging around and uh, seeing which one's going to be better. Um, you could also, uh, if you want to put some money into the whole thing, well, then we can say, Denise, Kathy, anybody know of a really good one that's worth the money? The very best one that I have used is called the Integrative Enneagram. And the website is Integrative 9. And... 
it has a, about a 98% accuracy of their assessments. Good. Is it particularly priced? <laughs> Right. Uh, here's what their website looks like. Uh, Enneagram for myself. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You sell it. Sell it. Sell it. Sell it. How much is it? I think it's about sixty dollars for. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, they all seem to be under a hundred bucks. Yeah. So, uh, but there are. My point is, there's tons of freebies that are yeah. out there. They don't go into a lot of detail, but they may very well tell you your type. So if all of you will just take a, a few moments to complete one more test, I'd be very curious if we continue our discussion on Thursday. How well That's interesting. Okay, with that, thank you all very much for joining in. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.